back in my head. How exciting. We are live. Excellent. Uh, thank you, everyone, for staying to the end of the day. I know it's a long day at DevOps. Always an amazing day, but lots of knowledge coming at you, yeah? So I really appreciate, uh, we really appreciate everyone staying. So we're going to be doing the next 50 minutes on are you deploying and operating with security in mind? <coughs> um, we're going to look at some of the overview stuff, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a deep dive into some of the container technology stuff that I've learned over the last few, uh, few years. And people often ask us why have we chosen in particular to look at containers from a um, sort of security perspective? And I think the main thing is the kind of marketing spiel, if you like, of containers is very attractive. You carve everything up, you put it in these hardened containers, and hardened means more secure. Yeah, you know, put it in these containers, ship it. The reality is many of us are dealing with tire fire applications. Yeah, we all like to think we've got, you know, some like, you know, amazing architecture, but we've all been there. Yeah. And when you put tire fire apps in a container, you literally get tire fire in a container. Yeah. Um, it's not a good look. I'll, I'll say <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, but it does, the consultants like me, you know, it enables us to kind of earn a paycheck. You can see the, the firefighters in the bottom, uh, bottom right there. That's what we're calling DevOps these days, yeah, or DevSecOps if you want to do security stuff. So it, it, it's you know it's, it's got its upsides as well in terms of like us actually going to help various companies. Um, the kind of TLDR today, just to prime you on what we're going to be talking about. So Steve's going to be going first, and I'll jump in at the end. We're basically saying containers do not make you invulnerable. They're a useful tool. But they are just that, a useful tool. And you've got to know how to work with them. And it's not just a code, a techie thing, but it's also a behavioral thing. Steve has definitely convinced me of, of the challenges I have as a developer. Some of the, you know, the, the biases. He's I'm... got lots of challenges as a developer, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Lots of like, um, bias. We're all, kind of, we're all as humans you know, susceptible to. I'm going to pitch that you need to add metadata to containers, do a few more tests, and really look at the runtime. We as Java developers, we as developers in general, need to be operationally aware to some degrees in the cloud with using containers. Uh, and that's, kind of, that's where we're going to go today. So very quick introduction. My name is Daniel Bryant. I work as a consultant and also a product architect at Datawire. So we're doing lots of stuff in the Kubernetes space, like telepresence and ambassador API gateway. And I've also, for my sins, written a book recently, shameless plug. It is available at the O'Reilly booth. Christmas is coming. Can I just mention that? I'm sure your other half would love one of these books. You know, be definitely a, a good look. Uh, and I'll hand over to Steve. Cool. Um, I haven't written a book. Uh, I've read them. Uh, am I on? Yes. Uh, so I'm I, Steve Paul. I work for IBM. I'm a developer advocate, which means I get paid to do this and to drink beer and go to parties and have good talks. Uh, I've been doing JVM development at IBM, as it says here, since before Java was one. So lots of VM experience and war stories and things. Done other bits and pieces like used to do DevOps and things like that. So stuff, relative stuff. Right. Okay, so we're going to start with the scary bits. So it's a security talk. So if we're going to do a security talk, let's just explore what that means. Because for many people, security means, huh? It's just a word, okay? So why do we care? Why do you care that you need to do something about security? What is it that's the problem, okay? And it's that E word. So cybercrime. Cybercrime, uh, whether it's uh, uh, nationally drive driven or it's um, um, it's uh, the mafia or it's the Russians or it's a group in any country you can think of, people are about getting onto the cybercrime bandwagon because it's the most profitable profitable type of crime. Okay, think about this. Twenty sixteen, cybercrime was worth, estimated to be worth $450 billion. And to put that in context, in 2016, the drug trade was worth, estimated to be about 435. Now it's hard to get solid estimates because the bad guys don't want to tell you how much money they've made, you know, but they can work this out, okay? That's pretty scary, isn't it? Because you know about the drug trade, you know about Miami Vice, and you know about um, people burying money and, and working it out by weight, and it's just like, you know, we've all seen those films, okay? Cybercrime is the most profitable type of crime for a bunch of reasons, okay? The first one is, which is the least risk? 
Who do you, who gets caught for cy for uh, cybercrime? Not very much, but people get caught for the drug trade all the time. Okay, which of these two, cybercrime or the drug trade, is growing the fastest? Okay, you probably can guess. And which is the hardest to prosecute? So you catch somebody, he's got drugs on him. You can go, they're illegal, you're going to prison. You catch somebody and he's hacking, I don't know, the US government. And you go, okay, but he's in Malaysia or something. Can you prosecute him? No. Okay. In fact, the chance are you can't find him anyway. And then which of these two bad things is likely to reach $2,100 billion dollars? For next year, but six thousand billion dollars by 2021. Six thousand. Do you think about that? Six thousand billion dollars. I want to do that. A lot of money. A lot of money. Okay. Let's put this in more context. Let's draw some pictures. So a little chart. The green line is the drug trade, the one that we know and love or don't, <laughs> and then the red one is the cybercrime. Okay. So watch what happens over time. Ooh, the thing is that the, the drug trade is pretty much static. It's not under control, but it's managed. Cybercrime, the red line, is just going out through the roof. It is out of control. It's out of control because these guys can make large amounts of money at it and there is not much in the way of defense yet. And that number, is about six hundred dollars or euros for every person on the planet okay and actually given the wealth distribution it means that basically in the us it equates to about eight thousand dollars each okay that doesn't mean the cyber crime they come and steal eight thousand dollars from you but they steal eight thousand dollars from your insurance company or from the people the you know um the car manufacturers whatever it is and they pass the cost on to you and that's what happens here. Cybercrime break in, break in, steal stuff, and you get a cost. Okay, so basically, it's probably going to cost you about eight thousand dollars next year or twenty twenty. Okay, if every single one of us. Okay. Okay. The thing is, the bad guys, the bad guys who are doing this, they're preying on the weak, the vulnerable, the ignorant. That turns out to be you. Oh yeah. Okay. And I say this, and people go, nah, I don't do that. I'm cognizant of what I need to do about being preventing people attacking me, okay? So, how many of you have ever Googled for getting Java to accept all, eight, all certifications over HTTPS? Anybody? <laughs> how to trust an SSL certificate? We've done that one, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. How many of you trust Googled for the very trusting trust manager? No. How to disable certificate, certificate validation in Java or pick your favorite application? Yeah. How about one of these? Anybody written one of these? <laughs> hey, Java programmers. <laughs> yeah, we've all done this one, haven't we? We've all done the, I can't figure out how to deal with that self science certificate. So what I'm going to do, because I Googled for it, is I just do one of these. Thank you very much. Is the client trusted? Yep. Is server trusted? Yes. So we've all done it. We do it all the time. The whole world does it. Everybody does it. How bad can it be? So I did a Google GitHub search on Implements Trust Manager. Okay, guess what I found? 72,000 hits. Oh, this, is, this, is, this is dynamic. We ran it again today. It would be a different number, but it's in that magnitude. Okay. Look at some of those words. A very trusting trust manager that accepts everything. Okay. The, a very friendly, oh, the trust all server wrapping trust manager. All kinds of certificates are accepted and trusted. Now, think about this. It's funny, but this is GitHub, and lots of this stuff, like you saw with the trust manager, are baked into real modules, real dependencies that you're using. You're using code, you're downloading, you're installing dependencies, and guess what? It's got stuff like this in it, okay? Scary, okay? And even more, more rant. 
How, given how important it is to use HTTPS correctly, which we all agree is a really good thing to do, hey, why do we turn it off? Any of you done these things? Wget no no check certificate, right? Sudo app get allow unauthenticated authenticated. We do this all the time, right? And when you go and ask people why they do this, you know, the server I access is self-signed. So I turned all checking off, not just for the server that was self-signed, okay? No, I want to I wanna access multiple servers. It's just too much of a problem, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, I like the, I thought that I was using the tool correctly. You guys trust people. You trust the code you download. You trust the tools. Oh, I, 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 I'm, it's too hard for me to learn how to use this tool, so I'm just going to cut and paste whatever I found on Stack Overflow. <laughs> yeah? I didn't realize what the default setting was, or I trusted the tool to do the right thing. Okay? And then the best one of all, if you're in an IT environment, is, hey, I didn't write that. How is that? Somebody's changed the script. We don't even book the source code, the build scripts that we have into the source code repositories. So we can't even check, check who changed it. Hey, are you feeling vulnerable yet? Do you want to turn off your computer? Do you want to go find a new job? Uh, right, so the thing is, what people, bad guys do, is they exploit your ignorance to install software, to use tools in ways that are weak, because you're not paying attention. But the easiest way to get in is using vulnerabilities. You hear about vulnerabilities all the time, okay? but people use vulnerabilities all the time. Steal your data, change your, change your data, crash your system, denial of service. It's like if you've got some code you've installed and it's got a vulnerability in it, let me bring your system down for you. Okay? Or I'm going to steal your compute power. That's a new one. Bitcoin mining. <laughs> hey, you have a build server. And my build server is running at 98%. It's, well, that's really good. It's doing loads of stuff. Yeah, 15% of it is Bitcoin mining. Okay. Did you know that? Are you checking for it? And then your server has vulnerabilities. People use it to get to somewhere else. Okay. So it's all about, it turns out, it's all pretty much about vulnerabilities, which are things like this. Can you see the bug in this major vulnerability? Okay. No, you can't see the bug because the bug actually is that there's not enough code. But you wouldn't be able to spot one of these, would you? Okay. How about this one? This is a diff. Okay. The one before, I'll tell you a bit more in a second. But this one, you can see, look, two character change. There's a plus one added. This vulnerability brought down a lot of servers when it came out because this is a bug in uh, parsing of doubles. It's a Java bug, and if you passed in a certain um, number, in certain format uh, double, this thing would loop. Because of this bug, the code would loop, and your system would hang. And it turns out that the header spec, whenever you make a, a, a post or a get to a server, you can pass in these headers, and some of those headers are expecting to get doubles in. So I could do a denial of service attack on your system, without even logging into your system. Because all you did was, you, I'd send you a header, you'd parse it, you'd hang. Okay? That was not deliberate. It wasn't de designed deliberately to do that. It was an exploit. Somebody found it, exploited it. So the thing to think about is that you're using all this code that's got vulnerabilities in. The vulnerabilities aren't things you're going to just spot because they're tiny things. Like they're little bugs, but there are people out there looking for them. Okay, they're not big smoking guns. There's not a big piece in the code that says, this is really vulnerable, let's fix it. They're just people chain these things together by looking at the code that you've installed and exploiting not only the weakness in the code, but the fact that you turn the security off and you use things without checking and you do this sort of stuff because they go, that's great, thanks very much. You're using an old version of something. You didn't want to update it because it was going to cause you to, you're going to have to write some more tests or do something. So you just go, thank you very much, okay? So this is the one I wanted to talk about, the one that everyone knows, the Equifax affair. Who'd heard of the Equifax problem? Yeah. Anybody had a similar problem with struts that you'd want to admit to? No, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is the CVE that, that's got the details in, okay. It's a remote code execution 
uh, vulnerability, which is pretty much what people are looking for all the time, because if they can get into your system and run code, they can do whatever they want. Okay. Um, as an ex how long have I got? How long do we split this? Oh, 20 minutes, Steve. You have plenty of time. Oh, okay. Plenty of time. Right. I've got the whole rest of the thing. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so Equifax, uh, this is the URL where you can have the whole, go read the whole thing about it. Uh, but it's really quite straightforward. The top part, you can see it says content type and then some GORP. And in the GORP, it says multi-part slash, slash form data. So what happened was you could post a request to the Equifax, to in this case Equifax, to any Strut server with the vulnerability. And you could post in, and Equifax would take the content type, and it would scan looking just for a piece of string that said multi-part form data. Okay, and then the struts would go, hey, it's great, I've got content type of this. Ignore the rest of the stuff, meant nothing. Great, thank you very much. So then it goes, I've got forms data. It goes to right drive the forms data processing, and the forms data goes, no, there's no forms data here, blah, bang, okay. And as part of the error reporting, the struts process, for some reason, looked at their data in the content type and went, oh, that's OGNL. That's a strut scripting language. I'm going to run it. And I'm going to run it for some particular reason that was unknown to the developer so that it could get all the data, report back to you that you had a failure, and here's what you needed to do. Okay. So it wasn't even trying to drive um, production, I mean, what's the word, of a um, valid path, it was driving an error path. As part of the error processing, this code got run. And you can see, Java, Lang, runtime, a get runtime, exec, curl, put whatever you want in. Okay, that was the vulnerability that was discovered. Okay, somebody was trying to be helpful by reporting errors in a nice formatted way with some extra information, got exploited, okay? But that's not just the worst thing. If you look at the timeline for what happens here, March the 5th on this particular year um, was when the vulnerability was reported, okay? It gets reported, it gets fixed, because that's what you want to do, okay? March the 7th, Apache starts releases the update. Thank you very much. Hey, great. I now have a fix. That's the point where the bad guys realize that there's actually an, an exploit that can be, a vulnerability can exploit it, right? March the 9th, two days later, these guys, the bad guys, are probing into Equifax's system using that exploit. They're in already. The probe is them looking around, trying to understand what they can get, what they can install, what they can steal, okay? They get to May, and then they spend three months stealing data. And it isn't until July that people actually figure this is going on, and then they fix it, and then they go into crisis management, and then, hey, guess what? September, a new one comes along, okay? My point is this, times will exploit. How long does it take them to make use of the vulnerability that they've discovered in your system? You've got dependencies that have got vulnerabilities. <clears throat> when that version of that dependency gets a vulnerability is discovered, how long do you have to get it fixed before you could be attacked? Well, in 2006, it was 45 days. 2015, 15 days. 2017, two days. So, you don't, guys don't pay attention to fixing things. You don't pay attention to the code you use. You don't update the, the versions because you're not paying attention. Vulnerabilities get found in these problems, in these, these packages. They get exploited. Two days. As soon as somebody reports an update, a CVE, in some version of your dependency that you need to fix, you have two days to do it before you could be being hacked. So, wrapping up here. Um, vulnerabilities are the way into your system. Okay? It's easy. There, everybody has them. And as soon as somebody figures out there's a vulnerability, you have two days to get it fixed on your system, right? So you've got to think about how you design your systems to deal with that level of update. Because if you don't do that, you're going to get hacked, okay? But we don't think about it. We ignore this problem. So, you know, part of this talk is to help you realize that you need to be thinking differently, okay? 
truth is, right now, it's really easy to get hacked. And so right now, the thing that's, that's most important for you is to be applying your vulnerabilities as soon as possible, just so you're less likely to be hacked than somebody else. Okay? Patching, 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 patching keeps you safe. And believe me, once they get into your system, right, they're there for the long term. Once they get in, they will go through and steal your systems. And believe me, we, well, I have got a whole bunch of talks on just how easy that is to do. But at the end of the day, for what we're going to talk about now, is you need to understand this is if you don't deal with security in your application, you don't deal with security in your deployment processes, you are very likely to get hacked the next time that you have a se severe vulnerability discovered. Cool. I will stop mm. at the security <clears throat> bit there. It always reminds me of that uh, story, Steve, is when uh, some people are in the woods, so two people in the woods, and suddenly yeah. a bear appears, yeah. uh, and the, like, one of the per people bends down and starts lacing up their trainers. And the person next to them is going, why are you lacing up your trainers? You're never going to outrun a bear. The person says, I don't have to run, outrun the bear, I only have to outrun you. Yeah. yeah. And that's the thing I think with security, yeah. isn't it? as in yeah. being like, the, the next person. Um, so I'm going to deep dive a little bit into container security now. And the reason being sort of doing this in this part of the talk is that I work as a consultant and I get to chat to lots of people and some people believe that containers give them a kind of hardened view of the world. Yeah. So if someone can get in and hack, containers can limit what they do. And there is some truth in that, but there's also some dangers associated with that. So we'll kind of pick some of those things apart. Look at some of the code stuff as well as the actual uh, the more high level infrastructure. Uh, is pe are people generally, generally sort of familiar with Docker and container technology? People sort of, yeah, see a few nods and stuff, awesome. So no real need to sort of spend too much time. It's fundamentally uh, operating system level virtualization. As Java developers, we're typically used to app level virtualization, the JVM itself. And we're often quite comfortable with hardware virtualization. That's your kind of, you know, your Zen, your KVM, all that kind of thing. And Docker's somewhere in the middle. So it doesn't really give us the isolation guarantees of, say, actual hardware VMs, but it gives us more than the JVM. We, we often share a kernel in the operating system level. It is fundamentally just a bunch of Linux processes or, or Windows, if you're running on Windows, and it's well worth remembering that. Even though there is certain security guarantees, fundamentally it's a bunch of Linux processes. So if you can compromise one process, you can compromise the next one. It's all around C groups, control groups, kind of basically uh, control um, and sort of the resources you can access uh, within a container, namespaces, do what they say on the tin. They literally namespace parts of the processor, but parts of the uh, sorry, secure, uh, networking, things like that. Um, and it allows you to define sort of certain isolation guarantees. And often you sort of you have a cheroot, you pivot into a new root file system. So if I trash a container root file system, I'm not trashing the actual host root file system. It's a great, I mean, Docker like, really did a, a favor to the container world by making it super easy to consume and use containers. Docker Hub, fantastic innovation. The API around Docker, the SDK, they made containers usable for many of us. And I've been, Steve and I actually both been fans and done a few talks on the containers for, for many years now. But the snag is, you know, the, the, you're all sort of at the vanguard. By coming to DevOps, you're keen to learn, you're keen to expose yourself to new things. But many of the people you work with in your team, or if you work as a consultant, the companies you work with, for whatever reasons, good and bad, they may not be so up to date with latest technologies and the implications of those technologies. And again, anecdotally, but people I chat to, when I say, what do you think a container is, the kind of analogies they came up with are the, the shipping container, it's a classic one, for sure. But a lot of people see them adding a lot of extra security. Oh, it's like, you know, it's like a castle, and I can build a moat around, around it. I think the reality is containers are more like a shared flat. Yeah, as in, it gives us a lot of advantages in terms of sharing utilities, sharing resources. But it also means if someone gets into one flat, they can very quickly go through the property. Yeah, once you've kind of broken through the hard shell, it's easy to go through the, the whole system. So I'm going to break this down and look at some of the runtime properties with security, some of the build time, and then a few other sort of bonus things as well. For the runtime security, I'm going to totally recommend reading the docs. I know this is like, you know, duh kind of thing, but so many people, myself included, as a, you know, as a developer, I'm, I just want to get up and running as fast as I can. I download the tech, I fire it up, I play around with it, I think I understand it. Often, 
I do understand it to some degree, but things like security often relies on quite a lot of nuance, particularly in the container space. Defaults are often a bit fuzzy. They, you know, they'll get you up and running quick, but it's not something you want to do in production. And it's not often you know, in flashing neon lights, you have to go look for this stuff. So I thought saw a fantastic talk um, by Aaron Gratafiori. Uh, is that two years old now, actually, but at DockerCon. But I wrote it out for InfoQ, and it was, it was a gold mine of information on, on everything from sys calls all the way up to packaging in, in, in Docker and in containers. Highly recommend read Aaron's work. I, I've just learned a bunch. Doc have got great guides on their website. The Kubernetes one I'll call out. Many um, people I chat to when I suddenly say, you know, or I say, when I say, have you read the Kubernetes security docs? They're like, what? Security docs, Kubernetes? But they're there. You can Google for them. And a lot of times they point at the great work um, with the CIS benchmarks. So CIS have done some fantastic work at thinking at how we should run container technology what config values should be set, how it, you know, the container technology should interact with a host and a bunch of other things. They fundamentally come up with check, uh, check boxes and they, the CIS in particular have everything. You can see at the top there the how to run Amazon Linux properly, how to run Apache web server, how to run Kubernetes, how to run Docker. These are gold mines of how we should be running uh, technology at best security practice. So you, they're quite lengthy documents uh, often, and so they're, they're checkbox style, but they're quite challenging to actually go through and read. But I do recommend at least one person on your team goes through and kind of gets the, the gist of this. But the beauty is a lot of companies have basically taken these check marks and codified them, automated them. So for example, Docker Bench, fantastic bit of kit. You can literally, uh, I often use it, say, with Ansible or Terraform. And the Terraform to spin up, HashiCorp Terraform to spin up an environment, Ansible to provision the hosts, and then we run a bunch of tests on the, on the infrastructure we spun up. We often use things like Test Kitchen just to assert we've opened the ports correctly, things like that. But Docker Bench will actually run all the CIS benchmarks and assert that you've set up everything correctly on that host. <laughs> um, so I highly recommend, you can basically, you can run it on demand, but put it in a CI pipeline, you provision an instance, you, you know, set up the ports correctly, maybe using SE Linux or using AppArm or something like that, and then you can run this program to assert, is my host set up to run, secure, uh, set up to run containers as securely as possible. Same thing for Kubernetes, so shout out to the Aqua security team, they do fantastic work in a whole bunch of container security products. It is paid for with Aqua, but well worth the money in my opinion. And one of their tools, it's actually an open source tool, so you don't have to pay for this one, but is KubeBench, and it does the same thing. If you're actually running your own Kubernetes cluster, you definitely want to be running something like this on every host, that every node that joins the cluster. If you're using Amazon, you know, EKS or uh, AKS on Azure, you hope they're doing this sort of behind the scenes anyway. But if many companies I work with are running their own Kubernetes cluster for various reasons, and I highly recommend every host that comes up run this to do the CIS benchmarks. Ports open, namespacing set correctly, things like this. The two fundamental things I, I sort of see uh, not looked at in the Kubernetes space in particular, because to be honest, I see a lot of Kubernetes these days as the, as the primary scheduler. Um, one is privileges, and the second one is capabilities. And privileges basically says what user you're going to run the process as. Too often, like Steve was hinting at, people get in through your app, but once they're on your box, they're running as root, so they can basically do anything. Yeah, so you definitely want to run as a non-root user on anything you do. Containers are no exception, but you can programmatically enforce it in Kubernetes. Capabilities is somewhat similar. It's a well sort of um, documented uh, Linux thing. It's not a container specific thing, but there's a nice API to implement them. You can literally sort of specify the capabilities your application, your container has. Can it access the network? Can it set the, um, the, the system time? Can it do a bunch of things? And even simple things like system time manipulation is often a really good way in to break systems, break SSL certificates. Do, do lots of very you know, similarly benign, be able to set the system clock can do a lot of damage. So you don't want to give the capability to your app to set the system clock. So you can literally restrict it in Kubernetes config. Real nice stuff. Dining it back a little bit, like Steve talked about, when people get into the apps, they can do a lot of damage. So we want to invest in tests in the build pipeline. We want to test you know, your code. We want to test your container. We want to test you know, your, how you're deploying that as well. So for me, one of the, the primary things I see with customers is knowing the software supply chain. 
we, we know we've heard of the latest Equifax, the latest Struts, Struts vulnerability. But when I chat to people and I say, what version of Struts are you running in production? Many times people don't know. And they sort of have a hint that multiple versions of Struts are running in production. They don't really know. And containers can actually give us a way to add metadata to what we're running, which we can then query. So if, we've, if we're kind of putting the main, say, um, framework uh, versions in our container metadata, if we know a vulnerability pops up, we can run you know, a query and say, oh, all these applications are affected. We're going to need to rebuild them, as Steve alluded to. So application metadata, you, know, you can put it on any artifact. Put it on your jar, your war, your ear file. But I think containers make it even easier. Yeah? And you do want to think about these kind of things to go on the container. You definitely want to have your, um, your version or your Git SHA because containers allow you to go that much faster, in my experience. Very easy for us as developers now to package and ship. No need to hand off to ops. But with that speed, um, you need to know what's going where. So the, the Git shar in particular is very useful. Things like build date, um, the image name you're kind of basing off in your Docker image, say. A bunch of other stuff, vendor, if you're sort of running third-party libraries, for example. And then you also want to try and put your quality control metadata on your container. Have you QA'd it? Have you checked security? Is there any metadata needed to run this in a safe way? Highly recommend sort of putting that on, on, on the actual container metadata. Now, quite fundamentally, I just use Docker labels. Yeah, it's a key value kind of thing. I'll create some namespaces and then add various properties and put them literally in the, uh, I've got an example here, in the actual Docker file in this case. Yeah, simple labels at the bottom there you can see. And um, there's a couple of tools. Um, there's a make file for automating a whole bunch of the, the Git char metadata, automating who's building it, where they're building it, a bunch of, bunch of useful things for forensics. If you've got a, a bad image you find, you can quarantine and look at the metadata to understand who built it, where did it come from, what was the problem. Hat tip to Label Schema and MicroBadger, they're trying to formalize some of these metadata ideas in containers, so check them out. Um, the one snag we've got at the moment with, with containers, and Docker in this case, is you cannot add labels dynamically at runtime. You can, you can add them, but if you commit, it basically creates a new image. And really with continuous delivery, you want a single binary going down the pipeline. What you kind of build, you want to run all your tests on, you want to deploy it. You don't want to constantly commit and create new images, but you do want to add additional metadata as that artifact goes down the pipeline. QA checked it, security checked it, performance checked it. Only then, you know, we deploy something in production with all that metadata. Good. Just like what I find myself doing now is actually using paid for versions of things like JFrog Artifactory or Nexus OSS. As this is a family friendly conference, I will say the uh, frog is hugging the whale there. That's straight from the uh, marketing docs, not my, uh, not my bad. But these are really nice tools in terms of being able to associate metadata very closely with an artifact. Yeah? So if you can't write it into the container, use something like this. Now, something I'm playing around with a little bit, I haven't used as much as I would like, and I usually only talk about stuff I've used in production, but this stuff I'm, I'm playing around with is a two tools I think are worth keeping on your radar, particularly if you're in Google Cloud, because Google Cloud are actually offering this as a service now. Uh, Graphius and Critus, or Critus, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Shopify are doing some fantastic work, actually, in the whole um, container build pipeline space, and they've talked a lot about how they're using a prototype in GKE, which is Google's hosted Kubernetes, to um, assert various properties on their containers they're building. And it's nothing kind of, it's not rocket science per se. All Graphius is, is a metadata repository, like your JFrog, like your Nexus. But they've, it's, it's been built with sort of cloud native and containers in mind. Yeah? And you can sort of recognize at the top there, you've got your standard CI pipeline. We're kind of, we're building stuff, we're QAing it, and various things going down along the pipeline. And all we've really got going on is before you can deploy into GKE, into Kubernetes, there's a test that basically looks for the metadata on the container. Was it built by us? Has it passed QC checks? And it will only allow that uh, app, uh, artifacts, containers, that, that are passed those, or basically have those signatures, those cryptographic signatures that indicate, yes, it was built by us. Yes, we've QC'd it. And Literally, you're writing that along the sort of stages of the pipeline. You're writing these things to Graphius. And Graphius has defined a really nice schema 
like a JSON schema type thing or YAML schema type thing. Um, and they've really done some thinking about the kind of things you want to write in metadata. Now, I won't go into it in, in full detail. Definitely check out the docs if you're interested. But this sort of one example is you can like do what's called attestations. You can, once you've done your checks with your private key, which you obviously keep super secret, you can sign this metadata saying, yes, I've built this thing. It was built on our known Jenkins server. Once you've done your, I think I've actually got an arrow there, yeah. Once you've done your tests, you can again sign some metadata saying, yeah, I, I you know, the, the server has run these tests, it has passed, and therefore we cryptographically sign that that has happened. And then you can make these what's called attestations actually in GKE. So we can basically look into Graphius, yes, we can say, has this container image been built by us? Does the signature match? Has it passed QC, security checks? Does the signature match? Yes, then we deploy it. So it's, it's, for me, it's, it's definitely a sort of, it's an open source project, Google themed. I do think it's very interesting as a kind of cloud native way to track metadata and allow us, when we know there's a vulnerability, we can very easily know what we've got in the pipeline. Yeah, and we've got some sort of safety guarantees here as well in terms of attestations of what we've built and what we've tested. Testing in a Java pipeline. So for me, this is super, super important. I kind of Java is my native language, as I often say. And I, there's a lot of tools out there, which I think people aren't always aware of. So I'll run through a couple of them now. But uh, hopefully many of you are using things like PMD and find bugs. Uh, like uh, if you're using um, uh, SonarCube, it's a very popular tool. You can, you know, these kind of things come for free, basically. I don't often see people using find sec bugs. I'll go into that one in a second, but find sec bugs is a find bugs module that does static analysis on your code and looks for sort of code errors like uh, SQL injection potential um, or um, command line project injection potential, dodgy logging. There's a whole bunch of stuff that's picked up on my code, which I'm like, wow, that's, you know, kind of you just write it quickly and you don't realize there's a potential loophole there. Things like OWASP dependency check, we'll look into in a minute, but you can basically scan your dependencies that Steve talked about. You know, most of the apps I write these days, Spring Boot apps or you know, Drop Wizard or Micro Profile, I'm bringing in a whole bunch of other dependencies. It makes sense, yeah, because we as developers don't want to write everything. You know, we're taught it's kind of you know, dry and so forth, and we don't want to repeat ourselves. So if someone's done something, bring it in, but can we trust them? Yeah, we definitely want to run some kind of checks on what we're bringing into our code base. This is doubly important in things like serverless as well. I've, I've had some amazing successes with serverless, but I find myself bringing in a lot of extra modules, and sometimes you just you get burned on what's in those modules. You definitely want to scan the image, scan your container image. My experience with um, a lot of Java developers, a lot of, sort of you know, classic enterprise Java developers, really good at coding, they just really want to focus on code. When they're forced to then package things in a Docker container, or a container in general, they're suddenly exposed to things like operating systems. They have to choose what operating system to bring into their container image. And a lot of them just go, you know, by default, Ubuntu, because they're comfortable with Ubuntu. But then they'll kind of, you have, to, you, know, you have to select your Java runtime. So they bring in the JDK, the whole JDK in the image. So you're literally running a full fat version of Ubuntu in production with a JDK, where in reality you should be running like a you know, minimalized, alpine, distroless kind of um, image, and you should be running a JRE, definitely locked down, those kind of things. So Docker Hub Scanner will pick up, uh, if you're running, say, a full fat version of Ubuntu with like Heartbleed or some kind of dependencies, the scanners will pick up vulnerabilities at the application or config level in your image. You've got your jar, but now you're wrapping it with a whole bunch of other things. And many developers are not operationally aware. They don't know the difference between Alpine and Ubuntu. And it may seem kind of funny to some of us in the audience, but I've literally seen it in, in, in uh, clients I work with. Not everyone is operationally aware. There's also a whole bunch of other things. I don't know if people have bumped into BDD security. Uh, that basically is a wrapper on the OWASP uh, automated penetration testing tool. So you can do some very basic automated penetration testing like uh, SQL injection, um, cross-site scripting, and you can do BDD given when then syntax to run this tool. So an, an Arachne is kind of similar, but more JavaScript focused. So you definitely want to be attacking your application from all angles thinking like an attacker to make sure that you don't get the kind of Equifax, you know, people jumping in your code. Um, I'll highlight again, Aaron Gratifiori stuff. Sirius is an amazing article that's given me so many jumping off points to understanding where all the vulnerabilities are in containers. So please do check out Aaron's, um, Aaron's uh, talk there. 
Just a couple of examples now. So find sec bugs um, is literally a, a module you put in find bugs in a, like Maven or Gravel kind of runtime. Uh, it produces a nice report and says, oh, I found this bit of code looks like potential SQL injection. This bit looks like bad logging, these kind of things. Super easy, no reason not to run that as part of your local build. Definitely part of your like, Sonar Cube verification. Dependency scanning, I mentioned OWASP dependency check. It's, it's not just Java. It does it for, I think, Python and Ruby and a bunch of other languages as well. But the, the, um, the Java one is as simple as bringing in about 10 lines of Maven config, or even less if you're running Gradle. And what it does, it looks at the rest of your um, dependencies, phones out to the National Vulnerability Database, and says, in this um, module we're running all these versions, are there known CVEs? in the versions of those modules. And just an example, I had a Spring Boot app. We weren't using it in prod, but I was just, it was like six months old. And I, I put the, this um, dependency scanner in, and basically I ran it. And I think, what, five things popped up? Finds five CVEs um, that could allow remote control of, of my app. And there were all new versions available. So all I had to do, like Steve mentioned, I popped in, put the new versions in, a couple of API changes, had to code a few things, a few new tests. But fundamentally, then we could deploy it, and it was secure. But if we just shipped it, we wouldn't have known about any of these things. Yeah? We could have potentially left these vulnerable um, libraries just floating around in our production app. It also gives a nice kind of UI, so you can give to the leadership if they're more keen to like the visual stuff rather than the command line. So, and it describes the vulnerabilities and the threat level of all the things that's found as well. Wrapping up the, um, the, the static image scanning bit, uh, there's a bunch of paid for tools like Aqua, like Docker. I highly recommend paying for them. They're often quite keenly priced, um, and also they do add a lot of value, and they're easy to integrate into your you know, pipeline. There are open source alternatives, Claire being one of them. It used to be a real pain to build it, to be honest. You, you could build it using Go, and then you could point it at your image, and it would scan the image for known vulnerabilities and so forth. Um, but kudos to Armin. Armin saw this talk, a version of this talk a while ago. He reached out to me and said, hey, I've put all this code built in a Docker container. So it's all open source code, so you can verify what he's done. And now you can actually spin up a Docker container, point it at another container, and it will check for known vulnerabilities like Heartbleed and a bunch of other things in that container image. Super useful. Hat tip to Armin. Really good there. He's got fantastic readmes online. Um, just an example, So, and I'm totally picking on the OpenJDK because I use the OpenJDK a lot. This is about a year ago now. Um, I basically just did a standard Docker pull, probably a bit small there, but a Docker pull of OpenJDK, the full fat version of, of OpenJDK, not Alpine and so forth. Um, and ran Claire on it, and this is the list of CVEs that it found. Yeah? Now, most of those are associated with the OS, to be honest, not to do with, with Java itself. And to be fair, OpenJDK has got like, a lot better over the years in terms of the image, and definitely the Alpine um, image now, I don't think it's got any vulnerabilities, maybe one vulnerability. Uh, and some of these vulnerabilities, the, the, the use case of you actually being exposed or you know, leaving something kind of open is actually very small. But we as developers need to understand what potential there is there. And that's kind of like Steve's point. We need to become, I think, more aware. Definitely over the last few years of, of my sort of um, career, I've, I've become a lot more aware of security implications, security risks. And it's our job as professionals to make sure our leadership are aware of that kind of stuff. People, like, developers are going to jail now on some of these fraud cases and so forth, you know, the, the Volkswagen um, scandal and a bunch of other things. I think it's only a matter of time before we see security issues, uh, you know, forcing developers going to jail. Yeah, it, so ignorance is no defense in a lot, of, a lot of law. So we need to run these things and inform leadership and make a you know, group decision on what we should do about these things. A lot of pushback I get is around what's called the last responsible moment. Now, I love this phrase from Agile. Basically, it means in Agile, you don't make decisions up front because you don't know too much stuff, particularly with features. Yeah? So you kind of learn stuff, you do experiments, and then you make a decision here at the last responsible moment if you don't make a decision, one is made for you, or it's going to be irresponsible. Yeah? But the snag is, is in, that's great for features. We don't know what our customers want. We iterate, we learn, we, we know we need to make a decision now, commit, go in this direction. We make it at the last responsible moment. The, a lot of people push back when I start talking about scalability, security, particularly sort of like business folk, and massively generalizing there on the label, but they'll say to me, oh, we'll think about that later. Yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll worry about that later. We're agile. We don't do security up front. We don't do performance up front. But the newsflash is that sometimes the last responsible moment is up front. 
Yeah. I, when I'm architecting a system, I need to know what kind of scale I'm going to be expecting. I need to also know, is it going to be like a government service, which is going to be constantly attacked and dosed all the time? Or is it like some mom and pops, you know, e-commerce site that no one's probably going to really look at? All these things make a lot of difference, yeah? And I don't think modern architectures like microservices and things like containers always make it easier. In fact, there's more things to learn about now, more abstractions means I have to, as a developer, I have to know more stuff, yeah? Which makes it harder. And it leads to a lot of this thing, kind of broken windows philosophy, yeah? You say, you know, I can fix this right or I can fix it fast. Show me what fast looks like. Once kind of stuff's broken, it just gets worse, yeah? And I've kind of been there. So that's pretty much it. Like I say, we've given you a high-level overview of some of the code stuff and why we think you should be looking at security now, why we'd like you to go away and evangelize to you know, your teams and the community in general. Security is super important, and we as developers need to take more responsibility. We've also you know, did, sort of dived quite deep into some of the container stuff, just as a, as a kind of pushback on some of the stuff we're seeing, or I'm seeing in particular, around people thinking containers kind of make them invulnerable. Once they've, you know, got, even if they've got a, sort of um, an issue, the container will kind of you know, encapsulate them and make them safe. Well, that's not the case if you're running containers wrongly. Yeah. I think that's pretty much it, Steve, in terms of... So we've got just a second. Can I show you? Can yeah. I come out of the browser? Yeah, go for it. I just want to show you guys, because it's... Uh, SSE. Okay. okay, can I fire up a browser? Let's see where your browser history goes. No. <laughs> okay. So this is website. This is just. You see that? Showdown.io. This is a website that searches the internet. It searches IoT devices. And as part of its IoT scanning, it finds all sorts of information. So I've just typed in Java. It's hit 95,000 servers. Right. Okay, so let's see. Look, it's found Glassfish. It's found, where are we down here? Here we go. Let me just make this bigger. Uh, it tells me things like version numbers. Look over here, Java Corporation 1.7. Okay, this is the information that you're leaking. Java 1.4. <laughs> oh, how do we vulnerabilities in that, hey? Right, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This isn't these aren't dark tools, these are standard tools that people use. So when we say to you, you're vulnerable, and you go, now they can't find me, it's like, no, you are, if you have a website, even if you have a port open, they can find out, they know how to do it, because these tools do it for you. So believe me, right, this is really important. All the container security stuff that Daniel's been talking about is really important, because these guys can easily find ways in, because there's so many ways in. Yeah. Agree, Steve. Yeah. And then on that scary end. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. We've got three minutes. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to shout them out and we can repeat them. No, they're all scared. Yeah. Yeah. See, running away already. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah. you. Oh. Thanks, Thanks,